Hi, everyone. I'm Shriya Kapoor, and I'm here to interview Sumedha Biswas, who is a PhD candidate at Radboud University, time again, in Netherlands since December 2020. She's done her master's from the University of Amsterdam in Physics and Astronomy, where she worked with Grappa and Nikif Institutes. She has been working on various topics related to gravitational waves since 2017 and has been a member of LIGO Virgo collaboration since 2019. Currently, she is also branched out into various areas of electromagnetic observation, with main goal being to detect various counterparts of gravitational waves. So, hi, Samida, we welcome you here. And hey. I hope yeah, this is a really fun session for you and all the people who are watching this. So, first of all, I introduced you, your professional life. So, maybe we could just hear like a couple of words from you. What are you working on right now? And um, how you're doing in general? Um, no, I think you covered it. So, like to summarize it very well, it's just the the goal is to basically try and detect uh, various electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational waves. And I think the easiest way to understand that is that, um, for example, if you look at the Milky Way, right, and you have all these different images of the Milky Way, for example, an optical or UV or X-ray. And the good thing about all these different wavelengths is that they give you all kinds of information. So if you have all this data together, then well, you have a more um, well overall better view, basically. <laughs> I would phrase that a bit dirty. Um, but the point is gravitational waves also contribute to that. So the main idea behind doing like in the science of astrophysics or everything is that you want to combine all kinds of data that you have. Uh, so that could be obviously everything in the electromagnetic spectrum, like optical and x-ray and so on and so forth, but also gravitational waves, because that just gives a whole new dimension. Right. So before, for example, I used to work more with uh, just gravitational waves and like very more pure gravitational wave research. So now it's just, it's like spread out a bit more. So, which so also means that I do some astronomy stuff. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So it's like looking at a big picture from multiple aspects so that you can make yeah, sense basically. of something. Yeah. yeah, so you want to attack the same problem in like multiple ways. Right. So if your uh, problem is that you want to properly observe an event or um, an object in somewhere in the universe, you have all these different tools to try and like understand it better. Uh, so that's the goal, basically, always. That's a good way to go about things in life, generally. Look. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so your journey has been pretty interesting. Like you did your bachelor's in India, then you went to Amsterdam and did a master's there and you are pursuing your PhD there. So how was the transition? How was your journey to now? Um, I would say mostly smooth, but I think at every level, it required a lot of hard work. Um, it was not easy for the most part. For example, so I, I mentioned it in the interview before, but uh, for, during the bachelor's, for example, I, I had a... I had to do extra courses and uh, things outside the normal curriculum because uh, I did my bachelor's in Bangalore, for example, and you don't have the honors system. So you don't get a bachelor's degree in physics honors, which means uh, you get a triple major degree, basically. Uh, so essentially, that means that you, you have, I have a bachelor's degree in physics, chemistry, and maths. So one third of the time I spend doing physics, as opposed to everyone else who spent 100% of their time doing physics. So... Obviously, that made a huge difference. So that transition was a bit hard, but um, it worked out in the end. <laughs> you had a lot of work, uh, working hard and a lot of stressing out, but it was fine. Um, and then moving to Amsterdam was, was actually a dream come true because I really wanted to go to the program that I got into finally. Uh, so that was, that was like my number one <laughs> target and that worked out. So I was oh, like really happy about that. It's a little um, late for me to say this, but congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. But yes, that was that was really cool. Um, and the program was very, very specific. So it it basically focused on so the track was called Grappa, which basically stands for gravitation astron particle physics. And I and in that you can do like a subtrack with gravitation, like just focus on gravitation, which was really cool. That's exactly what I wanted to do because I knew I wanted to work with gravitational waves and everything. So yeah, that way it was really nice. It was also very competitive and very hard. The first year, just like adjusting to that change um, that's involved from like going from India to like a different curriculum. Um, but it worked out in the end. It was really enjoyable. And I think out of the whole thing, I think I enjoyed doing the thesis the most. So the system is that you do like 60 credits of coursework during your first year and then 60 credits of just the thesis in your second year. Uh, the thesis bit was amazing. I think that was my uh, favorite part in all of that. 
that was really nice i have two follow up questions to this so you said that you knew that you wanted to work with gravitational waves so how did you know it like why not some other topics in astrophysics and then uh, what was your thesis about okay and <laughs> two really really big answers yeah. um so the gravitational waves bit for example i knew i've always known that i wanted to do astrophysics um i i can tell you that back story in a bit maybe but uh, that's a whole other story so anyone wanted to do astrophysics um and the extra program that i mentioned i was doing also during my bachelor's it's basically this program that was hosted at uh, the planetarium in bangalore so what they do is that they have all these professors from all um like raman research institute and icts and isc and these sort of places like all the institutes in bangalore these professors come they teach classes during the weekends um so it's nice and then at the end of each year you have an exam um and then you have to get through the exam then you get to the next year and because it's a government funded thing you get a small stipend sort of like to motivate you or whatever but in the third year what they do is that you can work at one of these participating institutes okay and do a project so when they like so they ask you like okay you know what do you want to work on um and this was 2017 and gravitational waves were detected in 2015 so it was like the biggest hot topic at the, at the time it was like we kept hearing talks there were seminars everywhere it was in the news and it was just it was the biggest deal at that point of time so like yeah, this seems really cool i want to do this um there was nothing more to it honestly it just it seemed really fascinating to me at the time so i said i wanted to do work with that um so i did my bachelor's project at icts then basically and that was more to do with initially it started off as like a reading course with um general relativity and just understanding those concepts and eventually it kind of merged into a bit of uh, numerical relativity but at a very very basic level obviously because it's a bachelor's project but it still gave me some exposure which was really nice um and yeah that continued i guess and when i did my masters thesis uh i did at nikhev so nikhev is actually the national institute for subatomic physics in the netherlands but uh but now they branched out into gravitational waves because you got there's so much funding and it's it's a big deal uh so yeah so they have really big gravitational wave groups so my project was mainly to do with trying to detect uh primordial black holes ah wonderful you saying <laughs> yeah using gravitational waves So it was really fun. It started out as a more theoretical project. So initially it was more about um trying to improve the pipelines like the various pipelines that are used within the collaboration like the LIGO Virgo collaboration and uh then it kind of branched more into modeling and like Bayesian modeling or uh, parameter estimation and things like that. So it was a bit of both um just so we basically again looked at the same problem but from two different angles. Uh so yeah, it was a lot of fun and primordial black holes were really interesting. so it's a lot of fun working on that i mean this is the topic of the day that you're using data and machine learning and neural networks to predict better models match with the data make everything efficient yeah but uh, honestly i know i don't know anything about machine learning <laughs> i don't work with that uh more but more with like the actual modeling of things so the thing with primordial black holes is that uh they aren't astrophysically in origin and what i mean by that is normally the black holes that we know of, uh you they basically dead stellar corpses right when a star dies you have a black hole like a really massive star uh but primordial black holes come from other mechanisms so the main problem with that is that if you do detect one uh with gravitational waves you can't differentiate between the two so that's why the modeling comes into the picture so you have to find ways that okay you know if i have a detection how do i know that this is primordial and not just a stellar black hole so that that was one of the main problems basically So then you like dig into the theory, you figure out all the formation mechanisms. <laughs> what can you expect? Um, what kind of parameters? Things like that, basically. I think I love this, like mapping the theory to modeling and data. What what you can take from the theory and what can the instruments detect and how mm-hmm. can you make sense of it? It's just beautiful. I love. Yeah, it's nice because you see everything in real time, right? It's not yeah. like you're just working on a theory. It's just you have that, but then you also have like actual data to test it all out. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's it's exciting stuff. And how did you get into astrophysics? Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> that I decided when I when I was four, I think. What the heck? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody did. No, I mean, no. Okay, to be fair, I, I see it in a more fancy way. I just wanted to be an astronaut. That that was the goal. Um, and this was around the time when Kalpana Chawla died, as well. and so it was all over the news it was um on on tv on uh, in the newspapers my friends were talking about it and i was like okay you know this seems cool so then that fascinated me and i was like okay i want to be an astronaut 
Um, but then I, I think I was always fascinated with anything to do with the skies generally, like even beyond just the astronaut bit. So then I grew a bit older, then I realized that you know being an astronaut is probably not as practical because that's much harder to do. <laughs> so I was like, okay, fine, then I want to do research. Um, but I definitely knew I wanted to do something with space in terms of either research or go to space if you're <laughs> that kind of person. But yeah, that's, and it never changed somehow. It always just stayed the same. That's wonderful. Like I've also had um, in my bachelor's, I've had friends who started with saying that, yes, I wanted to do astro. But by the end, they were like, how are you still interested in that? I was like, real interest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think as long as you're fascinated by it, I think it's, yeah. it's really worth it. But the minute you think something's, is. yeah, exactly. If you think something's boring, then you can't go very far, I think. Right. So this is quite nice, but I want to know more about you. Like who is Sumedha when she's not working with gravitational wave science? What is she doing? How, how is her life? Um, do, okay, so in, in terms of hobbies, I guess, is this that what you're yeah. uh, implying? Um, I, I do a lot of things, I think. Recently, I like went back to a lot of old hobbies. For example, I used to read a lot when I was little. And then in between for a few years, because of all of this, I just stopped. So I picked up that habit again. So that's been really nice. Um, watch a lot of world cinema. I love watching movies in different languages. Uh, that's always nice. Um, I used to paint before. That I don't do sadly anymore. Um, just don't have the time. It, it gets depressing, I think. And um, before, like when I was younger, I trained in both like classical music and dance. Uh, spent a very long time doing both actually. And now, I mean, otherwise I cook a lot, which is, as, as you might know, since you live abroad, it's, it's a necessity, but I think it's also therapeutic. It's very nice. Yeah. Comfort food. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's nice experimenting with it. It's like you, you put in a bunch of things and it turns out nice and it's, yeah, makes me really happy. But uh, yeah, things like that, I guess. Um, That's nice. Yeah. That's interesting. You have to keep yourself engaged with these things also so that you can focus better on your work when it comes yeah, definitely, to yeah. So, like, what inspires you on a day to day basis? It could be like a story, a person, an idea. What keeps you going? Um, I think I'm just always fascinated by everything. <laughs> like, it's like the more I do any kind of research, or like when you know, I talk to other people, even in the department or my supervisors, and we're just talking about a problem or we're talking about um, something out there that you know we're trying to figure out. It's just, it's so fascinating. I think that's the only drive. At the end of the day, it's just like, I just, I'm so fascinated by it and I want to know more. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say there's anything else, honestly. I mean, it would feel like you're a part of the movie, right? You're discussing black holes and you're working with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's so, like all of it is so interesting. And and the thing is, like, the more you do stuff, the more you discover that, like, you know so little. Yeah. So there's always. always so much to catch up on. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, I think. It's quite intimidating, but it's also fascinating, as you mentioned. Yeah. It, I mean, yeah, it's intimidating on one hand, but, um, but on the other hand, you always have things to learn about. Exactly. So it so never gets boring in that sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, yeah, I don't think it ever gets boring. Yeah. Apart from... If your code gets stuck for a long time. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a part of the process. <laughs> yeah. So, like, what you you went into gravitational waves when it was, like, a hot topic and a very good field to be. But what, apart from gravitational waves, do you like in astrophysics? Um, okay, that's... I think it's easier to say what I don't like. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. I, I would think most of it is really interesting. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I, I can't specify things like that. I mean, but I do specifically, I really like things to do with uh, the early universe cosmology. Mm -hmm. I, I find that really fascinating. Um, even besides everything else that I normally do. Mm -hmm. Just like how the universe came to be and like just the early epochs and things like that. But that stuff is really cool. And what do you not like? If that's easier to say. Well, I think that's politically incorrect to say, you know, <laughs> please like this. Um, I don't know. I, I think I'm not the hugest fan of exoplanets and I know a lot of really nice exoplanet astronomers, so it's kind of sad. But I personally, I just don't find it as interesting. 
like I, I like reading about it, but I I can't see myself doing research in it. That's all. Mm-hmm. That's all right. So, talk about talking about LIGO and its counterparts in various countries. So, um, what do you think is the importance of LIGO India coming? Yeah. Like, what differences is going to make for the students in India, for the professionals in India, and like the international collaborations? I think it's. I mean, for one, I think it's incredible, obviously. Um, secondly, the thing is, I think across the world in like most gravitational wave groups um, in all the countries that currently, there are a lot of Indians. Yeah. And <laughs> sometimes it just, I don't know, it, it, like the brain drain is a big problem, right? We, everyone talks about that. Everyone tries to leave. We left. Um, but I, I think that's one of the main things it could count though. It could inspire like the local people. It could get more people involved. Um and there's so many good, like incredible astronomers in India, obviously. So I, yeah, I think it's really important for the global level, just just because how good Indians are at research. That's true. And so if I was not a physics student and you had to tell me that, yes, LIGO India exists and I should be a part of it, how would you convince me? <laughs> but you're not a physics student at all. Uh, I mean, I'm a kid. I'm a kid who's new to the world of science. <laughs> I mean, if it were a kid, it's easy. Then you can just tell them all about space and the universe and give them lots of fascinating facts. Oh, yeah, that, that works with kids great. Um, we had an outreach thing recently and yeah, it was a bunch of 10 to 12 year old kids. Mm-hmm. They're so fascinated by everything. It was incredible. We're just, we're just excited all the, the entire time. But uh, but yeah, with kids that works, you show them like flashy images of like whole galaxies. You tell them about black holes. Um, yeah, I think with do kids you start. Do think like um, how how to simplify these concepts for kids? Like how how does outreach exactly work? Because people don't have the slightest idea about some concepts. So how would you try to make them have sense of it? No, I think the problem in certain cases is that people decide to. Um, like it makes no sense to delve into like a really intense topic right away. Mm-hmm. It makes so much more sense to just focus on like more basic concepts, like figure out how physics works, like more things that you can relate to. Right. That's a good thing about physics, right? Most of it is just around you that like right. you can see it, you can feel it. And I, so with, especially with kids with like younger ones who just, um, you know, they're just new to everything. For them, I think that's the best approach. Just like teach them about the world around them. Right. And then they get really fascinated. Then they have more questions. And I, I think that's the way to go. But the minute you give them like a really intense, hard topic, which they can't grasp, obviously, because they don't have the background, um, they lose interest. Right. It's, just, uh, it's counterproductive, I think. They wouldn't want to follow up on it. No, it's, it's hard. I mean, they could have questions, but even the questions that they might have, you'll have to explain a lot behind it, right? right? They won't be easy answers. And so in the end, it's like they learn nothing. I think it's a really good point that you mentioned that how to map the daily things with, so like, it's a very common activity for students where you take like a cloth and you put heavy objects on it just yeah. to depict the space time. It's like so natural and then you just quickly grasp like, oh, oh, that's what's happening. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Really good examples. So helps. I think because we are going to be putting this out in the women's week, so mm-hmm. I would like to ask you about your experience being a woman in physics and how you have been inspired by other women in physics and what you have to say to them. Um, it's, I mean, definitely the ratios are very skewed still. Uh, most like during, I mean, bachelor's was one thing, but during my master's or even now, the ratio of men to women is just, it's terrible. <laughs> They're like, women are a minority, obviously. I personally never faced any discrimination or anything because of it. Um, but I do have friends who have uh, because they're a woman and obviously that's not nice. I mean, that's the whole point, right? <laughs> that's like, um, but I mean, I, I would say it just makes no difference. I just, I don't understand what being a woman has to do with uh, being good at physics. Everyone can be good at it. It just right. uh, makes no sense. And there was one, there was a series of articles I wrote for this one website once. So one of them I actually had, I basically wrote about, uh, so they were all about women scientists, for example. Mm-hmm. And in one of them, I, I, was, I was reading up a bunch of things and there was this one study, I forgot which study exactly, but I can look it up for you uh, if you're interested. But they basically like interviewed high school kids okay. and they basically realized that until like a school level, in a lot of cases, girls outperform boys. 
especially in the maths and science subjects. And but the thing is, then then you have a societal problem that comes in where it's just assumed: oh, you're a girl, you can't do math, you can't do physics, you can do you should do the arts. Just <laughs> so there's a lot of problems. I think it's a systematic issue over like over time. Yeah, but I think it's changing. There are a lot of really cool women astronomers who like take the time to actually talk about these things to make like break the stereotypes, basically. So I think that's really nice. Um, but yeah, I think there's there's a long way to go, sadly. Like, can you point out a woman in physics who has personally inspired you? Uh, yeah. Uh, my master's thesis supervisor was Sarah Cordell, okay. who was I, I. I mean, she's still my PhD supervisor, actually. Like on paper, um, I think she's incredible because she at some point I, I she just had a baby, and um, I think people tend to assume that if you have a baby, you're just gonna be away. Yeah. And I I don't know. It's it's weird, but she managed everything perfectly. And I, I was so amazed. I was like, she was doing so much. And she had a baby. And it was just, it was all perfectly balanced. Um, so she was really, I mean, I think she's really cool. And also Samaya, Samaya Nisanke, mm-hmm. who's also in Amsterdam. Um, I've only spoken to her a few times. I, I haven't worked with her personally. But yeah, she's also incredibly cool, I think. And she really puts in the effort to like do the outreach, to mm-hmm. diversify those, like the surroundings and everything. Um, yeah, definitely both of them for sure. I think your case also reminded me of my professor in bachelor. So she also she also went for a maternity leave, but then uh, in every few days we would be like, she uploaded a paper, she got a paper published. We were like, what is happening? This is amazing. She's yeah. amazing. That's incredible, honestly. Yeah, but um, also like they really put in an effort, you know, to like include more people. That's that's really nice. And there's so many problems, I think, especially in like a global scale. Also, you have the racism issue sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, again, not something I face personally, but I know I do have heard of it. Um, like being a brown girl in astronomy is probably the <laughs> worst case scenario out of all of them. Um, but yeah, there are people talking out against it. So, But I think I would like to still point out Kalpana Chawla's case. She was also an Indian yes. girl in astronomy and she definitely was where she was. And like almost a generation ago. So yeah. And like she definitely. still inspires people till date yeah. and after this also. So that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah no, she was incredible. Um definitely. Yeah, I feel women like that. Um and also just yeah, the societal barriers are a bit much sometimes. Um, plus, you know, sometimes they're like, oh, you know, we shouldn't invest in a girl's education. What's the point? We can just get her married. Like, no, no, no. she's perfectly capable of doing so much more. I mean, why why would you not give her that opportunity? Yeah. So at this point, like after all that we discussed, is there something you would like to say it out to general public of girls that is doing physics or anyone who is doing physics and how your inspiration would help you say something that will inspire others also to keep oh, uh, to continue <laughs> and to keep going at it despite whatever problems I, okay now you've put me in a spot <laughs> i'm sure to think of like really good motivational quotes or something um i mean to put it very simply if you if you really like something just do it just don't stop for anyone else i think right i think that, that's, that's the most motivational thing you can say because motivation doesn't really come from great words always it's like looking at people like you who are doing it on a daily basis that's pretty inspirational okay <laughs> thanks but um but yeah i think that's that's what i would say i mean just i don't know if you like if you like it and you, you have a certain level of confidence which you should i think you should get that 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 yeah that's step one i think um develop some confidence in yourself you believe that you can do it and yeah you can do it okay so this was this was really fun talking to you. Thank you, Sukritha. <laughs> and happy International Women's Day. Yes, happy International Women's Day. Okay. Thank you.